let's let's do that together. Uh, let's answer questions. If if uh, some of us have any feedback, we are welcome welcoming it. Um, so just to let you know, at the bottom of this uh, slide two here is a link. And this presentation is an abbreviated version of a brand new um, guide that NAMPS has just published. This is the first time we're launching it. And it is a how to create a pollinator garden. Oh, good. Uh, Alice Kong from NAMPS has just posted the link for you. Um, so feel free to um, peruse, peruse that and uh, give us your feedback. And um, I'm now going to begin my presentation. Okay, so the agenda today is planning and solarizing your garden. Uh, solarizing meaning getting rid of the grass. Uh, then we're going to talk about how to design your garden and what which plants to choose. And then planting day. And finally, maintenance. Uh, before we get started, I want to share my favorite native plant with you. It's butterfly milkweed which is in the photo on the left. And I just love the bright orange flowers. They're lace-like and so delicate. Since planting it in my garden two years ago, I have experienced the wonder of the monarch caterpillar munching on the leaves. And it's just a thrill to watch. As you know, monarch caterpillars will only eat the leaves of the milkweed plant. And milkweed is their only larval host plant. Okay, so we have a couple of slides here on why native plants, but I'm not going to do a deep dive on this. Uh, this presentation is really about how to do your native plant garden. Native plants have many benefits. They provide a place for pollinators to live, and they provide a valuable source of nectar and pollen. And the nectar is the energy, and the pollen is the fats and protein. Native plants are really important for caterpillars. And I think we know this now with all the research that uh, Douglas Ptolemy has done. Butterflies and moths lay their eggs on the leaves and the plant becomes the specific larval host in many cases. Birds need caterpillars for food and to feed their young in the spring. Douglas Ptolemy says, and this is a really interesting fact, that one pair of chickadees needs 9,000 caterpillars to raise one clutch of baby birds. So this really emphasizes the importance of native plants, shrubs, and trees. Native plants will also help with water conservation, as many plants are drought resistant because they're in their local habitat. And as you know, they also contribute to biodiversity. So these are four facts, if you are a factoid data person like I am, um, and they're attributed to Douglas Ptolemy's research team. He's written over with his colleagues 80 research papers on pollinators. Um, we're all connected, and uh, he does a good, book, a good job of uh, explaining that in his book, Bringing Nature Home. Um, one of the key facts, and Lorraine Johnson talked to this last night, is that insects are responsible for pollinating 90% of all flowering plants. Um, in turn, insects are responsible for 85% of the fruit and vegetables that we eat. So they're part of the food chain. Many insects are plant specific, and that is phytophagous or herbivorous as Lorraine called them last night. Um, they seek out specific plants for food. They lay their eggs and select the plants as their larval host plants. And lastly, also from Ptolemy and his colleagues, caterpillars rely heavily on specific native plants for food. 75% of their food comes from only 5% of native species. So now let's talk a little bit about planning your garden. 
So there are four key questions to ask yourself if you're just starting out. The first one is, who will be there? Uh, will it be adults, children? Will there be pets? Will you have a sit spot, a place where you want to sit in the garden? And how will you navigate? How will you go from A to B to do your reading and your watering? When will you be in your garden? If you'll be there in all three seasons, then you'll want to plant plants that blossom in each of the seasons. And it's almost um, it's also much better for the pollinators because they'll have food throughout. Next, what type of pollinators do you want? Do you want to attract bees, butterflies, or birds? There's lots of ex excellent resources on the web. This is a very exciting emerging area of study. And there's lots of information about the relationship between insects and plants. An excellent uh, source of field studies is the inaturalist.org website. Another really great resource is your local conservation authority. Choose plants with different colors, shapes, and scents. Why? Because they will attract a wide array of native plants. And lastly, bumblebees and birds have specific needs in early spring and summer. And Lorraine talked about this last night in her talk. So we need to plant shrubs and plants and trees that blossom early in the spring and summer. So this is, I think, a wonderful, wonderful chart. And what it is showing, it's from the National Wildlife Federation. It's showing 15 trees and plants that pollinators love, and they're in order of importance. And I'll talk to that in a minute. Um, so there are 10 regional maps all across North America. And this is the compilation of research by Douglas Ptolemy and uh, Jared Fowler. And Ptolemy and his colleagues have done the research on caterpillars and Fowler has done the research on bees. So what this is, is the top, and I've got the link there for you. Uh, this represents our region, which is the Eastern temperate forest region. And the top eight trees here in order are Quercus, the oak, Prunus, the American plum and the cherries, Betula, the birch, Populus, the cottonwood, Acer, box elder and the maples, Malus, the crab apple, Carnia, the hick tree, and lastly, Pinus, the pitch pine, which is the Eastern and, and Virginia pine. So these are in order of pollinator attractiveness and ca caterpillar pollinator attractiveness. Uh, the top one is the oak and it, attracts 436 species of caterpillars that consider it their host tree. So very, very interesting information and research. Now, below the green line there are another seven shrubs and plants, and they attract both caterpillars and bees, and they're also in order. So starting with Vicinium, blueberry, and Salix, the willow, those are two bushes, and then going on to five herbaceous plants, Solidago, the goldenrod, Symphytrictum, the aster family, Helianthus, the woodland sunflower, Rudbeckia, Buckhead Susan, green-headed coneflower, and Herotheca, the camphor weed. So these are some examples of the, the species um, that are there. Uh, and they will attract both. So if you're looking to attract both caterpillars and bees, you can look at, at that list. The last question that you want to ask yourself is what plant species and how many are you going to plant? So space and budget will determine the size of your garden. And as a rule of thumb, 
you want to plant five to seven different species of plants and five to seven per species. And that's so you'll have a really nice burst of color. Choose your favorite colors, make a list of them and um, find plants that lend themselves to the number of hours of sun or shade that you get at your location. Use native plants to fill in the gaps in your existing garden. As your perennials, your cultivars are trite, you can plant native plants instead. And if you're starting from scratch, of course, you can, you can plan um, completely uh, with great imagination and creativity and not worry about what else is already there. Um, regardless, deciding what you want to plant is, in my opinion, the most fun of the whole planning your garden process. You get to dream. So here are some excellent websites and sources. So you can look at the different types of native plants available in your area. So first of all, there's the NAMPS plant database and also a really excellent database called Network of Nature. And then there are two books, and I have them both here, uh, Lorraine Johnson. So her first was 100 Easy to Grow Native Plants, and it characterizes plants into meadow, which is sunny and what most of us have in the city, and then prairie, which is west of Ontario, and then woodland habitat, which is shaded areas with some forest cover. Uh, in her new book, A Garden for the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, she goes even further and recommends plants for bogs, balconies, community gardens, and everything in between. And yes, uh, Brenda, I see you've just written that Heather Holmes books are excellent and they are, and they're listed um, along with other really great resources in the, um, in the guide that's the elongated version. So one slide on invasive species. Um, I'm just showing this to remind everybody that when you're planting your garden, you need to get rid of any invasive species uh, before you plant. And the first one on this list is periwinkle. And the last one is phragmites. Uh, these are the top 10 offenders, according to the Ontario Invasive Plant Council. Why aren't invasives great? Well, because they outcompete native species, they create monocultures, and they wipe out wildlife that's dependent on native plant species. And one of the most popular and yet harmful monocultures is, of course, grass. Just a word about Phragmites, which is in the photograph. Um, they're taking over the countryside uh, and they love to grow in wet conditions. You'll find them along roadside ditches, edges of ponds and lakes, and they completely fill in um, and are very invasive. So uh, it's if you find them, you need to contact your local conservation authority and, and get their assistance on how to remove them. They're not easy to remove. Preparing the garden. Okay, this is a case study. And this is the garden of my sister-in-law, Nancy Lang, and she's on the call today. Um, her uh, home and garden are located in downtown Toronto in a semi-detached house. I'm mentioning that because we'll talk about that a bit later. And uh, we began by solarizing the grass in fall 2021. We left the non-native evergreens at the front because she wanted them for Christmas decorating, for putting the lights up. And we took out the periwinkle um, at the front of the property. And so there was quite a bit of periwinkle and we got it out. Now, then we began to solarize the space. So we dug up the four corners and the four sides. And remember, it's only a 20 by 30 foot uh, area. Uh, so it didn't take us long. And we hired a person, uh, Nancy hired a person to relocate the downspout so that now the, the water from rainfall runs directly into her garden. Next, we put down cardboard over the entire area. Make sure you cover all the edges 
so no light can get in. And you can use bricks or stones to keep the cardboard secure. Next, we laid down the soil and we left some bare spots at the front of the house for ground nesting bees. You can also place logs or stones in your garden if you wish, so that insects can lay their eggs and have a nesting spot. So after adding the soil, we added the mulch and we covered the soil completely with mulch. The ratio is one to one. So the soil and mulch will be of equal parts. Make sure you distribute it evenly. As I mentioned, you don't want any light to get in for six months. And in spring, presto, the grass will be gone. And the last slide of this series is, do you want to place a divider between you and your neighbor? I mentioned that this is a semi-detached home and the front lawn is shared. So in order to protect Nancy's garden from having grass grow in it or vice versa, um, we put down some reclaimed lumber. We put down two 10 foot boards uh, down in the very bottom and <clears throat> about a foot under the soil. And then we put a, another board on top of the other two boards. So four boards uh, and they were cedar. And the reason we did that is that cedar is very durable. Okay, here's a slide um, that I put in to show, <laughs> to show my, uh, <laughs> my learning experience. So this fall, I decided it's, it's time that I <laughs> turn my front lawn totally into a native plant garden. So Nancy had inspired me. So then um, my son and I dug up the whole front yard. And again, it's about the same size as Nancy. It's not large. It's in downtown Toronto. And uh, that was great. And I thought, great, now I don't have to do the cardboard stage. Uh, well, what happened is, in fact, uh, we had a very mild fall, as you remember, and so the grass started growing um, upside down. Who, who would have thought? And uh, then um, in sometime in January, I had to go and get some black landscaping cloth uh, to put over the garden so that I'm snuffing out the light and hopefully we'll be able to plant um, and do all the solarization steps of putting down the soil and mulch this spring. Anyway, there's my, my learning. So a um, little bit about garden design. Um, so I have worked with many faith communities doing native plant gardens. And what I like to tell them is, don't worry about the fancy sketch you're doing. Um, I ask them to do a sketch and I ask them to, to prepare a list of plants and to figure out how much they're going to cost within the grant that I provide for them. Um, but this is just a very uh, rudimentary drawing done by a faith community a couple of years ago. And it's just to show you, you don't have to be an artist. Um, I love to design a garden in February when there's snow on the ground like today. And I can dream of all things green in the spring. Um, start to sketch um, as if you're looking down into the garden and draw in any existing features like uh, sheds, other gardens, driveways, etc. And Determine if you will have water in your garden. Year one, you probably won't want to do that step. Um, if you don't want to invest in a small pond year one, you can redirect the downspout like we did, uh, or you can just put a bowl of water out in the garden and change the water every couple of days. Remember to list the plants so you won't forget what you planted the next year. That sounds so simple, but I've had faith communities uh, completely forget what they planted. And uh, I've had to go back in my emails and, and uh, let them know what they had planted. So you forget over the winter. Decide how many plants you wanna purchase and see how this fits into your budget. It's always best to start small at the beginning since you can always add more plants in year two. And I recommend using the 80-20 rule for budgeting, which is 80% of your budget should go into plants, soil, and mulch, and less than 20% or 20% should go for a rain barrel, for tools, 
um, and maybe even a hose. Okay, this is Nancy's garden. And we're going to go through each of the species that were planted and tell the story a little bit later. But first of all, I wanted to show you her sketch. Um, she's an artist, so of course it's a gorgeous drawing, um, at least from my point of view it is. And, um, and we put the, the list of plants there. We planted five to seven of each species except for the strawberries, which are in the, the foreground near the sidewalk. We planted 10 of those. And of course, we planted one dogwood and one elderberry. We use primary colors. Nancy chose yellow, blue, red, and hot pink. She incorporated both bottle brush grass and Canada wild rye to give garden some added interest. And I thought that was a great idea is to incorporate grasses. I know a lot of you do that, but it just made the, the garden look more interesting. But here's a spoiler alert. We ended up taking out the bottle brush at the end of the summer uh, because it ended uh, up that it really overwhelmed the space. The Canada wild rye, however, looked great. And we love the way it gives a different texture to the garden. Planting day. In May or June, after the chance of frost has gone, and last year I remember that we planted in early June because we had a very late spring. But once you know, and the weatherman says that frost is no longer going to happen. You can plant your pollinator garden. First, you want to dig a six inch hole and then put some compost in the bottom of the hole. Place the plant in the hole and then put soil all around it. Press down lightly on the soil surrounding the plant and then water thoroughly. So how much to water and should I add mulch? Well, this will bring a variety of responses um, from different people who have different opinions. Um, what I have learned from people that I would consider experienced gardeners is that you may have to water a little bit more uh, in year one, especially because of climate change. Um, so water three to five times a week for the first couple of months, and then twice a week for the rest of the summer for year one. And by year two, um, we used to say, well, water once a week, but we're now saying uh, you'll be able to water less than year one, depending on the amount of natural rainfall. By year three, you'll probably not need to water at all. And that stayed the same um, because the roots are established and the plants grow in their natural habitat and they're happy and they flourish. Uh, adding mulch. Well, I recommend for beginner gardens, yes, add mulch to your garden. Um, it will help you retain moisture and it'll also reduce the amount of weeds. And especially for beginner gardens who really don't know what's a native plant and what's a weed, uh, it's good to have mulch there. You can leave bare spots uh, in your garden so that there's nesting habitat. So uh, that's what I recommend. I'm sure there will be differences of opinion on that one, however, um, and that's fine. Here is a photo of Nancy's garden in early fall. We couldn't believe how well it did for year one, and it's flourishing. It, the plants were full height in color with the exception of, exception of the cardinal flower, which didn't have any flowers, but the, they were growing well. Um, the green was growing well, the stems and leaves. And we think it did well because it got lots of rainfall and lots of watering, and it was well weeded in the spring. And I think one more time in the summer we weeded it. 
um, some tips for spring and fall maintenance. So in the spring, weed when the weeds are small so that you can remove them before they get large. It's so much easier to do that. And deadhead the flowers and cut down stems in the spring, not in the fall. And this is something new that uh, native plant gardeners are now recommending. And this will allow insects and birds a resting habitat during the winter. Uh, it'll also allow food for birds because they'll eat the seeds from the, the flowers. So in the fall, leave the flowers and the stems. We said do that in the spring. Leave the leaves, leave them because they're great. And they have great nutrients. And then remember to prune the shrubs and small trees in the fall so that in the springtime, you'll have blossoms. And if you do prune in the spring, you run the risk of cutting off the blossoms. So that's why we say do it in the fall. So let's go now on a fun tour of Nancy's garden. This is great for a winter's day. Here are the native species that we planted. So the first is Zambucus nigra canadiensis elderberry, and it's near the front porch awning and gets partial sun, which it likes. And it won't grow very tall, it'll grow six to 12 feet, which works well. So we don't want a big tree providing shade for the, the garden. The second shrub that we planted is Cornus sericea, red osier dogwood. And it's a dwarf variety and will only grow again six to nine feet, which is good. Um, dogwoods are one of the most beautiful and popular native trees in Canada. This one has white flowers in spring and in the fall it turns bright red. Ah, oh, Menarda. So I love Menarda. This is from my garden. Um, up north, Monarda didma, and it's the cousin to Monarda fistulosa, wild bergamot. It delivers a very showy burst of color that lasts from midsummer to fall. Um, and like the rest of the mint family, it's easy to grow. It spreads quickly via seed, but also via its vast rhizome root system. Uh, I've uh, given so much Monarda away to friends and family over the years because it's it's rapid rapidly growing and it, I wouldn't say it's invasive at all but it likes uh, it it likes to grow. <laughs> Lobelia cardinalis, the cardinal flower, is also an exquisite flower. It relies largely on hummingbirds to pollinate it because insects find it hard to reach its long tubular flowers. Cardinals need moisture to be happy. So you've got to make sure they're well watered. Like its cousin, the cardinal flower, Lobelia syphilitica, blue Lobelia needs lots of moisture. And it's not drought tolerant, just like the cardinal flower. And similar to the cardinal flower, it's also pollinated by hummingbirds. Coreopsis lanceoleta. Lance leaf coreopsis. It's a member of the hardy aster family. It's easy to grow. And here it is in Nancy's garden alongside blue lobelia. Most of you are familiar with the sunny face of the black-eyed Susans, Rudbeckia herta. It's also a member of the aster family and birds eat the seeds of the black center when the plant matures and dries out. Echinacea purpurea, purple coneflower is another member of the aster family. This one has pinkish, purple flowers. And there's a debate as to whether these are pure natives or near natives. Um, 
they originally came from the Eastern United States area, uh, but they have now been growing uh, for several decades in our area and, and they flourish here. Wild strawberries, so we planted the wild strawberries near the sidewalk, if you remember. And they really attracted the neighbors. The neighbors thought they were fun. And isn't that great? And look at the red berries. Uh, they attracted lots of bees. Um, and the, the berries were eaten by birds and small mammals uh, and also small children. And I think maybe some larger children. Okay, the next uh, is Alismus hystrix, Canada wild rye. And this is the grass that we planted. It really was absolutely exquisite. And it grows very quickly and has large seed heads in the fall. Uh, some other grasses that I would recommend are blue stem and wing stem. And they're native plant grasses. But there are many to choose from. Okay, the uh, last section of my presentation is taking you through maps which show and showcase 20 native plant nurseries in Ontario. There are several other reputable native species nurseries in Ontario, the rest of Canada and in the US. Um, and we have um, several nurseries in those areas on the NAMPS website. Uh, I know that there are also other websites um, like Network of Nature that has, uh, that has a, a map as well, uh, a mapping system. I did this so that you can look at where you live and say, okay, these are some vetted native plant nurseries in my area. Um, the first is Southwest Ontario, Chatham and Sarnia. So if you live there, you've got some local nurseries. The next is the Lake Erie Shore. That's what I'm calling it. And go from Welland over on the right-hand side all the way to London, Ontario on the left-hand side. Hamilton, Kitchener, Guelph and Brantford. So here are five more nurseries in these, these areas. Um, Ontario Native Plants, which is number four, is the retail operation of Verbinens. And as of last fall, Verbinens is no longer providing um, plants um, unless you're going to order 25 of one species. So that's why it is not on the list, but its retail operation is Ontario Native Plants. These are all great nurseries. And then if you live in the Toronto area or north of Toronto, Orangeville, Collingwood, or east of Toronto, Peterborough, here are some other nurseries that you can drive to. And then of course, there's the native plant sale. And uh, we can talk to that in a minute, native plant sale that North American Native Plant Society does. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank TD Friends of the Environment for funding this talk as part of the 2023 Hen Gardening Week series, Gardening Week series. Um, and it's always a pleasure to be part of the Halton Environmental Network's Gardening Week. Good. So, um, that's my presentation. Um, I would uh, like Alice Kong to be able to talk a bit about uh, the CDEX program and also uh, the native plant sale. All right, I'm just promoting her to panelist and in a second she should be able to Hi, Donna, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, NAMPS has an annual native plant sale for 
many, many years since going back to the 1980s. Our sale this year will be at Toronto Botanical Garden. Um, it will be on uh, May the 20th, which is a Saturday from 9.30 to 2.30. Um, I will soon be putting more details on the website, so be sure to check our website. And also the plant list will be on the website in April. Um, I'd also like to mention our Seedex, which has been very popular this year. We've had over 70 requests for seeds. There are still some left, but I suggest that you check the list on the website, which has been updated in the last couple of days. And uh, just send an email to seeds at namps.org if you want to make a request or if you have any questions. Thanks, Donna. If, um, was there anything else you wanted to know? No, that's great. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So thank you very much, Donna. Um, one thing I'm curious about, uh, how many people here are considering a native plant to garden in the near future? So we do have a poll if you're interested in going out to find it. Here we go. There, are you planning on creating a pollinator garden in the next 12 months? So I should have been a little more enthusiastic and said, yes, you bet, or no, <laughs> what will the neighbors think? <laughs> Or maybe not this year, but I will consider, seriously consider it for next year. And then we'll get to some Q and A's. All right. I'll just give it, okay, most people have answered. So I'll just give it a couple more seconds, full 45 seconds to answer the question. There we go. So the results, can you see the results? That's great. Yeah, 95% of uh, the audience today is uh, going to create a pollinator garden. So let's get to some of these questions. Um, Thank you, Helen, for doing that. I forgot to do the poll at the very beginning, so thank you. <laughs> it's all right. Um, right, so we do have the recommendation of Heather Holm, which I have not heard of those books, so that is a great recommendation, and I'll be sure to check them out. Is that something, that one or any of the other books that are recommended, does anybody know if we can get them from the local library? Oh, I'm sure you can. I'm yeah. sure you can. And she's, you know, one of the forerunners uh, speaking about the relationship between bees and uh, and native plants. She knows her her um, her native plants. She is also a, a Canadian and now uh, teaches in the United States. But uh, she knows our she knows our flora. Mm. And there are several really great books listed in the uh, educational resources section at the back of the guide that we published. Oh, and so as you can borrow books from the libraries, I know that uh, the two Lorraine Johnson ones are at the uh, Toronto Public Library. I'm sure they're in any of the libraries. Um, and so I know you can get them there. You can also buy them at Indigo. Right. So it should be should be readily available. Um, someone, oh, did get buckthorn in their free pile of wood chips. Uh, yeah, I, I feel for you. <laughs> That's never nice. So, you know, there's, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, yep, somebody commented, oh, your sister commented that you planted the cardinals near the downspout for moistures, uh, moisture. And then, um, so Coreopsis and Blue Lobelia, someone asked, Two different conditions required. So Coreopsis can take a little bit drier conditions. Blue Lobelia needs a little bit more moisture. So do, they, uh, do you think the Lobelia is hanging on because of watering by hose or? That's my guess. Yeah. That's my guess. And um, I think that the Cardinal, the other Lobelia, uh, probably didn't flower because it's just taking a little bit more time to establish itself, even though, as Nancy said, we planted it near the downspout. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm, I've grown cardinal now for about five years. And, um, you know, it, as long as you water it, 
it will do well. And so that's the same thing for the blue lobelia, its cousin. Yeah, I, I have a, we put in a very small pond in our backyard and I had planted blue lobelia and red cardinal in a drier location and they somehow made their way over to my pond. <laughs> and now they come up. So I'm like, I'm not questioning this. Love it. <laughs> yeah, I have a blue lobelia. I have a blue lobelia that grows in a pot every year and I look forward to it coming back. And uh, it just, I think maybe a bird brought the seed over or something, but uh, yeah, they grow in pots quite nicely as well. All right, so now we're getting questions about um, solarization or is there anything we can do now to get our garden going? So can we start solarizing in the spring? Um, I'll well, I'd say start collecting cardboard because that's where I got caught. <laughs> <laughs> to find that amount of cardboard, you really have to keep your eyes open <laughs> during recycling day. <laughs> and, and don't so, forget to take the tape off. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think you could start collecting the cardboard and then start looking at your square footage of your lawn, uh, which is what I did. And then uh, there are cubic converters. You know, you can take your linear square footage and convert it into cubic square footage for your garden. And then you can decide how much uh, soil and, and mulch you need to purchase. So yeah, you can do planning right now. And then as soon as the ground starts loosening up, um, you can get in there and as we said, dig, dig the borders, uh, dig the grass back um, and then get ready to solarize. I know somebody that did their solarization two years ago in the spring and they said it took them uh, two years to you know, have the grass not come up in spots. Uh, so you can you can put down the um, the cardboard in the spring. Uh, it's just that you've got to make sure that you've really got good coverage so that there's no light that gets in. Yeah, no, I'll be honest. I made a garden and I put down the cardboard in the spring and I put soil. Now I had to put down quite a bit of soil, but I planted right away. And I haven't had, the only issue I've found is that the edges, the grass will creep in. So I have to every year make very defined edges to keep that grass back. But I haven't, because I put so much soil down on the actual garden, I was able to plant right away without the grass coming up there. So yeah, interesting, yeah. interesting. Um, that's good to know. And I think, you know, the other, just the other reason for maybe wanting to, uh, prepare, put the cardboard down and the, the soil and the mulch in the fall, is then in the springtime for Nancy's, we, we got to get excited about planting already. Yeah. So it's just a psychological, uh, I think, rationale. But again, that's great to know that you can do it in the spring because that's what I'll be doing. <laughs> um, we have a question about um, native plant nurseries in Hamilton. So there was bee sweet that was in Hamilton. Um, was there's name? also Ontario native plants in Dundas and there's origin native plants in Guelph. So they're all an hour away. Yeah, so pretty, pretty close. Um, are there any recommendation for children's books to introduce pollinators and gardening for children? Anybody have anything? It's a good question. I'd go and Google. I know I saw a couple of children's books at Toronto Botanical Gardens gift shop a year ago. Um, I don't know if they were any good. I looked at them. Um, but I would bet you that if you Google, you can sort of get a good sense because they usually give good descriptions of what the book uh, covers. And, uh, or, you know, go on uh, your public library website and they also give good descriptions. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody has a mulberry tree. So how far away should they plan their pollinator garden from the mulberry tree? And yes, they're very messy, messy plants, mulberries. And so I do. Yes, yeah, so I had one until I uh, brought up my front lawn. Um, I don't know the answer to that, to be honest, but I know that I would leave at least 10 to 12 feet. I mean, I'd be conservative about it, especially if you don't want the mushy berries in the garden and squishing them when you're walking uh, and weeding. Um, you also have the option, dare I say this, of removing it. We used to use it as the Halloween tree in our family. And I had opposition from my kids and my husband. I always wanted to take it down. 
Uh, it was here when we moved in 40 years ago, but uh, I finally got to do that. Um, so, um, all right, so people are, a lot of people are planning or um, they're going to, they're already working on one. That's wonderful, by the way, to hear that 95% want to plant a garden and 5% are thinking about it. When uh, Clement Kent did the webinar for the NAMPS uh, speaker series this past January, 97% said they wanted to plant a garden. So that's very positive. There's lots of, uh, you know, lots of people out there that are keen to start. And we're seeing that in, in specific neighborhoods now where you're seeing some clusters of gardens as opposed to, you know, one garden in this part of a city and then another garden, you know, 12 miles away. You're starting to see what they're trying to do, which is pollinator uh, corridors. And this is what David Suzuki is promoting, uh, the David Suzuki Foundation, and also, of course, um, Douglas Ptolemy and his homegrown uh, parks campaign, which is in Southern Ontario, 90% of all the land is private. So if we're really going to do something, we all need to step up and we need to plant a pollinator garden in, uh, in our yard. And then uh, the neighbors will see it and hopefully um, you'll have an organic growth syndrome happening. And uh, somebody did mention that they'll be adding duplicates and triplicates of many of the plants to produce drifts, which is a very good idea for two reasons. One, as someone who has designed gardens myself, avoid the one of itis <laughs> disease where you have one of one plant and another of another plant. And it just, that's where you get the chaotic look. And it, that's where the neighbors are like, oh, I'm not so sure about this. But if you plant, as Donna had mentioned in her presentation, five or, and usually odd numbers work well. That's mm -hmm. psychologically to look at. Um, odd number of plant five to seven of a species and it's better for the pollinators because they're not like flitting around going from here and where's the next one where's the next one they're like oh here's all the rudbeckia so i'm going to pollinate here and then i'm going to move on to this one and then i'm going to move on to this one so yeah drifts very good idea it's more pleasing to the eye and it's better for the pollinators thank you helen that's well said um here's a, here's a question about how to remove periwinkle yeah well, uh, we removed the periwinkle at uh, Nancy's garden, and then the fall I saw it, some of it had start to, started to grow back. Um, and I've tried to remove it up north, and I've, I've, there's been such a large clump there that it's on the hills. I'll never get it out. However, uh, in the city, we'll just go back and we'll get our <laughs> little hose out and we'll get in there and rip it up again. And so it's really by being persistent. And I see you've got one acres, yeah. And uh, so it's a big job. Um, I don't have any magic as to how to remove it, but you should be glad it's not Phragmites. They're friends of ours up north who lost their pond. And by the time they contacted the conservation authority to figure out how to get rid of Phragmites, their pond was gone and could not be retrieved. Okay. So, um, Oh dear. Um, we have an allergy to bees. Now, the good news is most of our native bees are solitary bees and they don't sting because they're solitary. So the honeybees, because they live in a hive, they're protecting the queen. Those are the ones that sting and people tend to have an allergy to. Now, of course, always check with your doctor, but solitary bees, they live on their own um, and they're not going to sting you. And most of our native bees, their stinger actually isn't even big enough to pierce our skin. It's really to protect themselves from other invading insects. So um, that's the good news about having pollinator gardens. So lots of good ideas as how to get cardboard from, uh, from veterinarian clinics, from thrift shops. Um, and yes, and yeah, 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 auto yeah. parts warehouses. So that's great. Or yes. look, out, look yes. out on the curb on recycling day. But that's a, a continued process. Um, yes, you can dig up your grass right away and plant right away. You're just going to have a little bit more of a challenge of keeping any weed seeds down. That's the only issue. That's why this the solarization is best because you're killing the weed seeds, but you can plant right away. It's just you're going to have a little bit more work on your hands. Um, now somebody made the comment that Ontario native plants, mail out plants, yes, they do. Uh, they They will let people come. Uh, to their retail location, which is the same location that, as Verbinnens, it's the same operation, but they prefer to mail them out and they use Canada Post, so. 
Um, I see rabbits. Oh, well, rabbits came up last night in Lorraine's presentation, and I'm afraid she didn't have any good news about how to get rabbits or deer, nor do I. Coyote. Um, coyotes. <laughs> coyotes is what Helen recommended, and uh, they, they like rabbits. Um, but also, they also like chickens. <laughs> um, yeah, build, take a deer fence and put it around the area. That's the way you're going to get them to not come around. Yeah, unfortunately, I have a lot of fencing in my backyard because they are after everything. So it doesn't look that great until the plant is truly established. So I'll be honest with you, but it is the best way is fencing. Um, for people who might be on budget constraints to finding new plants, great ways are make contacts, join Facebook group pages, because um, once a plant is established, it tends to become very prolific, prolific and they want to share. People who are gardeners love sharing their plants. Um, as Donna mentioned in her presentation, she loved, she has a bunch of um, Marnarda that she likes to share, right? Yeah, and there was a really good uh, mentioning last night of uh, the Ontario Native Plant Gardening Facebook page. So I looked it up this morning. So that's a really good way to tap into a network and, and uh, share your experience and help other people or get help. Um, I also wanted to mention that there's a really good talk coming up next, and Helen didn't pay me to say this, but it's at 12 noon, and uh, it's Oakville Green, Anelia Tikova, and she's going to be talking about making seed balls and starting native plant seeds in winter. So one of the things that the NAMPS uh, members uh, an association want to promote is an affordable way to create your native plant garden and seed gardening is that way because the, the seeds are very, very inexpensive, especially if you get them through Seedex or even through friends. Um, and that way you can uh, have a native plant garden and not have it cost as much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, start with the seeds. Pollinate Berry is a great Facebook page as well. We have a question about how do you recommend disposing of invasive species? It depends on what kind of invasive species it is. And I would, uh, I would contact the local conservation area. You know, if it's Phragmites, I know that, that Halton Environmental Network removed Phragmites from one of the faith communities uh, a year ago, and it was a large process. I know that you got a, a remediator in to remove it, and then they took it away and burned it. So. Mm -hmm. It depends on what the invasive species is. Mm -hmm. um, Some of them, uh, Lorraine actually touched on this last night. So if you put them in, uh, I believe it was Lorraine, uh, you put them in like a, a black plastic garbage bag and you leave it in the sun for about a week. That black plastic garbage bag tied tightly will um, cook it basically. And, and then you can throw it out, but make sure the plants are dead. And, it, and, and as Donna said, it depends which plant it is. Summer and somebody asked a really good question is, do I need mulch? Uh, or can I use something like last year's leaves and spring garden debris? Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. That is the best mulch. Uh, it is the very best and it's also the less expensive mulch. So yes, you can use anything. You can use plants, um, you know, cuttings and uh, just put everything into back into the garden. Yeah. What I do every year is I actually get into my compost, I dig down, uh, and this is in particular for veggie plants, but I've also done it for, for native plants. And I dig down in the soil, I just put the, the compost underneath the soil and then plant the plants or, or put it around the existing plants if they're already in place. You can't, you can't put enough nutrients in the soil is the answer to that one. Very true. Right. Okay, somebody else has said another Facebook resource is Ontario Native Plant and Seed Exchange. Oh, I, that's a new one. That's great. I will look that one up. Mm -hmm. Great. So Nancy um, has, has said here, sometimes the ongoing news about our environment is overwhelming. This is a small way to make a difference and it's highly rewarding. Mm -hmm. uh, gorgeous to enjoy in the day and helps you sleep at night. So Nancy has been absolutely over, overwhelmed and thrilled 
by planting the garden. And she's had lots of neighbors ask her what she's doing, uh, want to learn about why she's doing it. Um, so it's been a rewarding experience. Plus, her garden is absolutely beautiful. I'm hoping mine's going to look that fine. <laughs> so we're getting close here. Do we want to take one more uh, uh, comment or question? It was again about the oh, hang on. Um, nope, it was about the mulch. So I think we have answered everything. Somebody said they love Clement Kent. Yes, he's got a very good presentation that he gave. Um, I was actually uh, the person that recommended him. So on the NAMPS website, and it's also in the guide we've published, we've got the 10 latest uh, webinars and the links to them. You'll see his latest talk, which was in January, and it was how to create a native plant garden. And he, he didn't touch the area that I went into, but he, um, he talked a lot about different ways to solarize um, than just my way. I mean, he mentioned things like you can solarize with light gravel or he had some very innovative thoughts. So I'd recommend listening to that if you're interested. Uh, any chance you know how to deal with creep, Creeping Charlie? Uh, yes. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, um, I, I, I tried to get rid of it at the back of our property and then I just gave up and I let it grow now. <laughs> so, do you have any thoughts, Helen? No, um, I think just honestly the solarization and then let it go full year, not just the six months, like a full summer where the, we get this really baking heat. They'll just fry it. So I think, uh, I think that's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. I enjoyed the, uh, the chat box and all your comments and helpful hints. Oh. And uh, I hope that you have fun planting your native plant garden. Well, thank you very much, Donna. It's been great to have you on our Halton Garden Week. Um, you've provided a lot of great information for everybody. I do hope you all do start your pollinator gardens or add to them with this information. But uh, coming up at noon, we have making seed balls and starting native plants uh, from seeds in the winter. So that might be one people want to tune into. At 1 p.m. is all about rain gardens, ready for rain with Mary Ann Bell from Multiple Green. At 2.30, we have Reimagining Community with Selena Young Long sorry, from the Milton Public Library. And then at 4 p.m., peat use and horticulture and peat free alternatives to save the planet. So full day ahead. We hope to see you a little later on. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Helen. You do a great job every year. <laughs> Take Hi. care.